Aberdeen, a city of contrasts. A busy port, a thriving centre for agriculture and fishing, an industrial area, a popular holiday resort. The Greenwich City, the silver city by the sea, with its bracing air and shining stone. How did Aberdeen become as it is today? To find the answers, we have to travel far into the past. Museum, a big part of what we collect is relating to North Sea oil. In fact, we're the only maritime museum, museum anywhere in Britain that has a, a collection focused specifically on North Sea oil and gas. So yes, it's part of my job here, that's, that's a big part of it. Based around the harbour, it was very much the fishing industry and also the shipbuilding industry. Um, the fishing industry, obviously there have been fishing boats coming and going from the harbour back to the earliest times. Uh, but by the 1880s, the herring industry was the, was the big um, industry, um, fishing industry, and uh, of course, before that was the whaling industry. So the whaling ships were calling at Aberdeen on their way up to the Shetlands and Greenland and Iceland. And part and parcel with that were the shipyards in Aberdeen, the, I'd say about 3,000 ships built in Aberdeen that we know of. Um, and so they, they were the, the predominant industries based around the harbour. And of course you've got, um, being a port, you've got imports and exports coming through. So textiles, wool, buttons, that kind of thing, um, going in and out of the city as well. It wasn't until uh, 69 uh, when uh, the, the, the uh, big discovery of Ekefisk in the uh, Norwegian sector was made that more interest in the central sector came and of course it was all dramatized by the discovery of Fortes in 1970. Okay, you ready? Okay, here we go. We have crash lap now. So uh, by the mid-70s it was clear uh, that, that the UK continental shelf was going to be a major province, uh, even by world standards. That was a period of slump for the shipyards uh, in particular. The shipyards had had a real boom in the 1950s, replacing the ships that were lost in the Second World War. And that, there was a slump right across the UK of shipbuilding by the 1960s, so it was really fortuitous in, in that sense that it, the oil in, uh, North Sea oil was being discovered at around the time when the shipyards were kind of at a low ebb and they were looking for something to, you know, um, for their workforce to do. With these oil supply vessels and um, the, the oil related shipping coming into the harbour, taking up the berths, the harbour board could make a lot more money from the oil industry than they could from the fishing industry. Aberdeen Harbour really lends itself to the kind of the medium to small sized uh, support vessels that are the lifeblood of the oil industry. For they are the ones who do the research to make the mud, to build the tool, to run in the well, to make the test, to log the zone, to set the packer, cement the pipe and fire the gun, to perforate, to pump the gel that carries the sand, that props the frack, completes the well to produce the crude that runs the world for all the people all over the earth who live in the house that oil built. Yes, it takes a lot of muscle, and it takes a lot of iron, and it takes a lot of thinking, and it takes a lot of trying to keep them rolling, keep them rolling, keep that 
big red rolling on. Well, peak oil is an idea that's been around for, for a few years now. Uh, the first ideas about this uh, were promulgated by a, an American geoscientist called uh, King Hubbard, who published some papers in the 1950s analyzing the, uh, the future production uh, possibilities in uh, the US uh, onshore. And uh, he was predicting in the 1950s that US production would, would peak in the 1960s, late 1960s, early 1970s. And um, actually his analysis wasn't far out. Um, it actually did peak in uh, 1971. And uh, some of his papers were saying 1965, 66, and one of them said 72. So he was, he was pretty good. And at that time, uh, nobody else really was predicting anything like that. They thought uh, that US production would continue to go on and on and on. So, um, I mean, his analysis methodology, uh, which he then uh, evolved and developed in the, in the succeeding years, um, came to be seen as a valid method of predicting when hydrocarbon production would peak in uh, countries around the world. And uh, the adherence to the theory uh, also use it to, to try and uh, predict when world oil production will, will peak. The, uh, to appreciate again the, the, the situation of our modern industrial society is contrasted, say, with the past future with regard to the fossil fuels, or the, to appreciate the fossil fuels in human history. I've taken this time span here from 5,000 years ago to the present to 5,000 years in the future. And what we call recorded history began about 5,000 years ago. So what this shows is that this Washington Monument-like spike here is the episode of the fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, and every other kind of fossil fuel in human history. Mm. It's the most disturbing thing that's ever happened to the human species. It's responsible for our technological society and in terms of human history, it's a very brief epoch. 